Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for SBB One Year Later, Lessons Learned and New Strategies for Finance Teams. My name is Devin Clark, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'm Sentime's Director of Demand Generation, and I'm joining you from Boston, Massachusetts. Please feel free to share where you're joining us from in the Zoom chat. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few webinar housekeeping notes. First, we are recording, so if you are curious to go back and re-watch this webinar, we will send you an on-demand recording via email by tomorrow. Second, we just kindly ask that you engage with the polls. It gives our speakers an understanding of who you are, and it really helps guide the conversation. Additionally, if you are joining from CPA Academy, you are required to answer at least three polls for CPE credit. So there will be four total polls throughout today's session. Once we launch a Zoom poll, there will be a pop-up on your screen where you can select and submit your answer. For any reason, if you don't see the question there, um, there should be a poll button that once we launch the poll, it will be at the bottom bar of your Zoom interface. And you can click that and it will surface the poll window on your screen. And for any reason, if none of these options are working for you today, you can always just write into the chat and I will follow up with you directly after the webinar to make sure your answers are heard and that we ensure that you receive credit for today's webinar. And then lastly, we are on chat and Q&A, so we encourage you to submit any questions that you have for our speakers through the Q&A feature on Zoom, um, and we will do our best to answer them live or at the end of the session. So with that, I am pleased to introduce to you a great panel of speakers we have today, BC Krishna, CEO and founder of Centim. We have David Koda, Executive Vice President of Banking at First National Bank of Omaha. And then we also have Andrew Waters, the Director of Product Management at Centim. BC, do you wanna kick us off and share a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, especially a shout out to Ryan Douglas in Seattle, who seems to be enjoying uh, unseasonably warm weather. <laughs> I wish we could say the same and have unseasonably warm weather here in Boston, but we don't. Uh, but, you know, I think that the 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 warm is turning here and look forward to, you know, the spring uh, playing out and then getting back into the summer season here. Um, when I'm not playing weather reporter, I am the founder and CEO of uh, Sentime. And prior to starting this company, I started uh, a few uh, fintech companies. I've been an entrepreneur uh, in the Boston area for about 15, 20 years or so. Thank you for uh, setting this up, Devin. Looking forward to chatting with you, David and, and Andrew. Excellent. Um it's nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is David Coda. As Devin said, I'm executive vice president at uh, FMBO or First National Bank of Omaha. I've been with our company for 25 years. Actually, uh, this year uh, will be 25 years on, on the dot for me. Prior to that, I worked for a large bank down in Dallas, Texas, but I'm joining from Omaha, Nebraska. And so BC, similar to you, I caught Ryan from Seattle. My son, our middle son is a freshman at the University of Washington. And this is uh, the one time a year he sends sunny, bright pictures of uh, of the campus, which just has looked spectacular over the last couple of days. So um, I lead banking for FMBO. Our company is both a, a regional bank uh, and also we are a consumer finance and, and credit card company. And so our, our company is organized in that way. So I'm accountable for really all banking uh, business lines and operations at FMBO. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Obviously, we're a longtime partner uh, with Send Team and, and uh, look forward to the conversation today. Hey everyone, Andrew here, uh, talking to you from Princeton, New Jersey today. Um, Director of Product Management here at Sendtime, uh, focused mostly on our banking and accounts payable um, functions right now. Uh, prior to Sendtime, I uh, spent some time working at Mineral Tree, um, an AP automation um, startup also founded by, by BC, and I did a little stint in the insure tech space as well, uh, working with commercial carriers to help them with profitable business. And yeah, excited to take you through um, a demo uh, towards the end of the presentation today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. And just as an FYI for everyone, I launched that first poll question. We'll keep that up for about five minutes. But in the meantime, BC, I will hand it off to you and we can get into the meat of the content. I know we have a fun discussion lined up. 
Or if we get into the meat of the content five minutes in that I don't know what we're going to do like 25 minutes in, um, <laughs> let's give it a shot. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, maybe we should just pause for a second. It looks like, is it like par for the course that people will have trouble with polls? Sometimes. So if you are not seeing the poll, we recommend that you go to the bottom screen of Zoom. There should be a kind of icon that has a poll on it. You can click that and that should surface the window. And again, for any reason, if you can't see it, I will follow up with you directly after if you reach out in Q&A or in the chat. Thank you, Devin. So, you know, I hope that some of you um, on the webinar today were on the it, it, a webinar that we did about a year and a month ago, shortly after the Silicon Valley Bank failure. Uh, David uh, Koda, who is with us here today, was on that webinar as well, along with one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Chris Sands. And we had a very, very robust discussion about Silicon Valley Bank and what caused the failure, what the problems were, and some of the you know, actions that people were taking, you know, uh, in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's, uh, you know, issue, failures. It's been a year and a month. Um, and SVB, of course, is, is not in the headlines today. Um, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, is now part of First Citizens. There were a few other banks that were impacted as well. Um, you may recall that uh, First Republic, uh, which also had similar challenges, is now part of J.P. Morgan. Uh, Pacific Western Bank, which maybe was not in the news as much, is now part of Bank of California. Signature Bank, which was in the news, is now part of the New York Community Bank. Uh, so on the one hand, it might seem that you know the banks that were significantly impacted have found decent homes. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever challenges that we may have you know seen in the banking community at the time have mostly settled down and like you know everything is sort of clear and wonderful on the surface but the reality is and i you know many people have used this metaphor to ill effect and i i confess that i don't want to use this metaphor extend the metaphor too much but it does feel like you know we've done nothing more than rearrange the deck chairs a little bit on the Titanic, the reality is that, you know, nothing has fundamentally changed. The FDIC insurance coverage is still at $250,000. Um, you know, while banking is a very robust business to be in, and, and, and I'd, I'd love to get sort of, you know, David's sort of viewpoint on it from his perspective. The fact is that, you know, the, uh, the risks that lie above and below the surface are still very much, you know, something that businesses can and should worry about. But beyond What's not in the news beyond the issues of, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, FDIC coverage to business bank accounts extends only to about $250,000. There are other issues that are more operationally important for us to consider that what I would say it needs to be, you know, part of a modern day business bank account, you know, and those are the things that I think we want to talk about today. Um, and uh, before we dive into the three or four topics that I think can easily extend our conversation to several hours. Um, I wanted to just really turn it over to you, David, and sort of see if there's any response that you have to, you know, what I just said. Yeah, I think it's it's a really good point, BC. Last year, certainly the bank failures and and some of the disruption that was resulting from that caused a number of business owners to ask really good questions um, around where their money. Um, sits on a day-to-day -day basis, how they access it. Um, also, at the same time that those bank failures were playing out, interest rates were resetting to a much higher level, certainly. And so the cost of, um, or the opportunity cost associated with just sitting on idle balances also began to come to the forefront. And so while the prompt last year may have been this moment when we had three of the four largest bank failures in our country's history, the, the fundamental questions that are being asked are just the, the conversation that you and I will have today um, is relevant in all circumstances. And so whether there is something that prompts it or a precipitating event, um, the reality is thinking about your cash, understanding where and how you manage um, your banking relationships and the utility that um, you're able to um, introduce into that system that you use for managing your daily cash is 
it's always relevant. And so this is a good conversation. It, it's natural to market a year after um, the, the conversation we had last year, but, but certainly these are um, good discussions to have at all times. When we left off, I think the, I'm going to use the word knee-jerk response that many CFOs had that were sitting on decent sized balances in their bank accounts was to say, oh my God, I need to do something about this. And they had two reactions or yeah. three reactions. One is like, eh, you know, nothing's going to happen. I'll be fine. The second is that I'm going to open a bunch of, I'm going to diversify my balances and I'm going to open a bunch of bank accounts um, at, you know, many banks and carefully monitor my balances and ensure that I can, you know, rest easy knowing that the balance at any given bank is sort of, you know, un, within some reasonable FDIC limit coverage. Right. That was the second thing right. that many people did. Yeah. And the third that they did, thing that they did was to say, you know what, I'm going to pick, take my money and put it in a big bank, a JP Morgan, a Wells Fargo. And, and I know I'll go to sleep. I'll go, I'll sleep well at night knowing that too big to fail will save my skin. Um, let me start with the too big to fail comment. What's your sort of view on it, right? I mean, you know, I'll, the, the provocative comment I'll make is that if everything rests on the success or the non-failure of four or five big banks, yeah. why do we need anybody else? Why not just like take it to the extreme and say like, we can all be served by four banks? You know, the I, I, it's it's a natural question for um really anyone to ask. And and it it was a big part of the narrative that we saw um, emerge last year at the time that Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and First Republic were all facing their challenges. And each of those had, as you outlined at the beginning, a different resolution. But there was this narrative around too big to fail. And is that just the response or the reaction that as a business owner or depositor, you should default to? Um, I understand that logic. Um, but I also see and understand the value of a highly diversified, very stable, enduring banking system within the U.S. We have over, we have over 4,000 banks in the U.S. And the value of that network of community banks to regional banks to large-scale national banks is something that we shouldn't take for granted. And so if you run your premise out to its fullest conclusion and you concentrate the entire deposit base of the U.S. into three, four institutions that are perceived to be too big to fail, where well, you've actually dramatically re you know, reset the risk framework of the entire industry. And so there is great value in the diversity of um, the U.S. banking system, let alone the value. If anyone you know, is from a, a community, you also see banks show up in meaningful ways across you know, numerous communities. And uh, and the extraction of that would be something I think we would all feel. Um, but the challenge is this tension then between this desire to be in a safe and secure environment and yet uh, a need to avoid over concentrating if depositors are seeking safety by moving to a too big to fail posture. Um, how do you balance that then as a business owner is, is a real question. And it's one that we talk to you know, our, our business clients about every single day. I mean, this is the point, right? If you take it to the extreme, you're actually creating more problems than not, right? I mean, the very right. challenge of being able to diversify is, you know, doing what you do, taking all of the deposits and concentrating in four banks is the exact antithesis of what needs to be done. Right. And, and, and as you know, we have worked together. There are other ways to solve this problem. And there's other ways to solve this problem in the context of the current bank diverse banking environment that we have That's and it's this thing that is called a sweep account right and not to get too specific but i think it's important for us to identify this as a device and a mechanism and a product that is available to I mean, obviously we offer it, we offer it in, in partnership with you and 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 that's a, an important element of it but many other banks offer it too you know and so i would suggest that Businesses that are worried about diversification, even if it's not in the headlines, should think about what a, you know, a uh, sweep account uh, product uh, might be from their bank to ensure that they don't have this problem. They don't have to take the deposits and run into a big bank. All they have to do is to seek out the sweep account might be offered by their existing bank partnership. That's right. I mean, the, the industry has responded, as, as you know, you and I will talk about. 
in creative ways and looking to extend that FDIC insurance from a single point of entry, you know, across multiple banks and do it in a way that is more um, efficient and effective for businesses that are managing large, larger cash flows that would exceed the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit at any one institution. Um, but you have to educate yourself. You have to, you have to ask questions, you have to be informed and, you know, it's, it's worth having a position if you find yourself on um, in one of those companies or in one of those businesses working with your bank and your banker. I, Sorry, I I'm keep... just going to interrupt really quickly and just let everyone know second poll has launched and it seems like we have some agreement on the sweep accounts that others who are in the chat, this has worked well with them as well. Um, and the, the point also I want to make is going back to what I teed up. I said, like, you know, there were, there were, there were several, uh, you know, finance leaders that went to big banks. They sought out, you know, their own manual diversification. Maybe they discovered sweep accounts. But many of the others that I've talked to, David, I want to tee this up for you as well, which has said, like, you know what? Nobody's ever lost money to bank failures, right. you know. So I think that I'll be fine. You know, if I look in the history of time, like, you know, nothing has ever happened. And like, you know, the government is always going to be there for us. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good question. It's, um, you know, as a banker, I don't want anyone worrying about bank failures. Um, but, you know, let me, let me break down that question a little bit. Um, obviously, first and foremost, as, as you and I talk about often, you know, the, the U.S. banking system is incredibly strong. It's enduring. It's well diversified. We've, we've talked about that. You know, in fact, since the uh, Great Recession, uh, a little over 15 years ago, bank balance sheets and capital levels are as strong as they've ever been. So banks are a safe place to hold cash. The FDIC insurance protection, which we've talked about a bit, and I know we'll talk about even a bit more, adds even another layer of protection. And so it's, it's, it's merging all of these factors together when you are responding and saying, listen, why, why should I be concerned? Um, we have the protections in place as an industry. Um, the banking um, uh, system itself is very strong. And all of that is all of that is extremely true. But ask anyone that had exposure to Silicon Valley Bank or Signature Bank or First Republic within the past year in BCU and I, you know, know many um, people that did. And they'll confirm that, you know, the disruption to daily business operations that occurs when a distress situation hits and a bank fails, it's significant. And that's nothing to say, you know, that, that's not even considering the anxiety and the worry and the distraction that comes with managing those moments. And so avoiding that disruption is a real reason to consider how your bank deposits are protected and the way in which you are um, accessing um, security and safety beyond the FDIC insurance. And again, the great thing is those tools um, are available for you. But um, let me just offer some perspective on bank failures, because another fair um, retort would be, I, I get it. We had three large bank failures last year. They were headline grabbers, and rightly so. They were three, again, of the four largest bank failures in the country's history. But aren't, you know, aren't bank failures a fairly rare occurrence? Um, fortunately, in the past five to seven years, they have been. Um, while there were the three banks that that we've talked about that grabbed the headlines, there were two additional banks in 2023 that failed. There was a Heartland Tri-State Bank in Kansas. It was about a $140 million bank. Citizens Bank in Iowa was a $66 million bank. Those two banks failed. Didn't get the headlines, certainly, of the larger three. Um, but there was a conversation that was beginning to emerge because we just simply hadn't seen many bank failures um, in the previous five years. In fact, in 2021 and 2022, there were no bank failures. There were only um, eight bank failures in 2019 and 2020 combined. So we went over five years with very little um, disruption in the industry. And that's a great thing. But if you pull back the lens and you look at a similar five-year period, coming out of the Great Recession, 2008 to 2012, there were 465 banks that failed in that period of time. And collectively, those banks represented $700 billion, $700 billion of assets across the banking industry. 
If you go back even further to the early 1930s coming out of the Great Depression or in the early stages of the Great Depression, there were over 9,000 banks that failed. Again, that's more than double the number of banks we have in the U.S. today. It was actually that moment in time that prompted the uh, FDIC to be formed, the Federal Deposit uh, Insurance Corp. And uh, it launched in 1933 and had an immediate effect to calm depositors that their deposits were going to be safe and were going to be all right. And so, you know, this does happen in cycles. Um, the banking system, again, is sound and very strong. And yet you need to um, be thoughtful around how you construct where you hold your cash and how that cash is protected. Because while there isn't a loss that may occur, um, there is disruption and there certainly is stress and distraction that occurs in those moments. And so if there are ways that you can protect yourself or position yourself against uh, having to endure that, um, I think we all would agree that that's, uh, that's a good step to take. Let me make a couple of different observations some questions as well um, that we'll try to respond to here. I think one thing that we want to just really make sure that is very clear is the distinction that we should make in our minds as operators, as sort of senior managers, as people responsible for, you know, running businesses, the distinction between risk and loss. Uh, you know, uh, while losses may be rare, they're rare because we have infrastructure that prevents those losses from occurring. At the same time, that doesn't mean that we should be taking wanton risks knowing that those losses are rare, right? Uh, I joke with my friend Chris, who's not on the call today, that you know he has a propensity to walk across the street in traffic, right? Uh, that is a risky thing to do, you know, but the chances of you being hit by a car and slow moving traffic is relatively low. Doesn't mean that this is a best practice. That's really what we're talking about is that it's really, really important for us all to look at what risks we face, particularly the liquidity and the cash that we have in our business to ensure that we take the steps that are necessary to mitigate the risk of loss. That is a very basic thing that we do in, in our personal lives and we should be doing in, uh, in, you know, in business as well. Yeah. Not to preach, but yeah. a basic point. I wanted to just really get to this question. Sorry to interrupt, but I wanted no, to get to no. the question about what are the risks involved in sweep accounts? I think I want to clarify that the sweep account is a bank product, typically. And without getting into too much detail, the way in which sort of sweep accounts are structured today is that, um, you know, uh, there are several underlying products that are used to support the sweep account. But the summary is that... Um, you establish a target balance, let's say $250,000. And the way the sweep account works is that the, anything over $250,000 is then parceled out into small $250,000 portions and then placed in a network of uh, participating FDIC insured banks. So there's no government involvement in this, so to speak, but it's just all leveraging the existing banking infrastructure and the rules around FDIC coverage. So in the aggregate, when all of these monies are swept out into this network of banks, what you'll find is that you can do the math, but the number of banks that participates can vary, but it's of the order of 100 to $200 million that can be insured across a network of, of, of these banks. That's the way in which the sweep account works, right? So that's yeah. the general idea. And a and a and a crisper description is um, insured cash sweep, right? Exactly. And and you know there are sweep accounts where you take a single balance, it goes into a single um, interest bearing instrument or account, um, and that may not or likely would not carry the FDIC insurance coverage that you're describing. And in insured cash sweep takes a balance above your $250,000 or a target balance that you set, and it moves that out into a network of um, insured positions that are all managed um, in an automated fashion. So it's not, it doesn't require manual intervention on the, on the part of the business owner, but it provides them assurance that any balance beyond that base balance that they would hold at the originating bank is going to have the FDIC insurance protection. And so it's a nice way to marry the protection that the industry created back in the 1930s with just larger cash balances that naturally continue to build as um, our economy and as 
business in general continues to grow. Um, thank you, David. I think, again, like there are, as you said, just to recap, there are many different forms of sweep accounts, different sure. banks offer different configurations of it, but the principle is all the same, right? Which is that you're yeah. trying to like ensure the balance beyond the base limit, you know, and, and that, and I think these are really powerful products and, and, and I think some, anybody that sort of is running a business or has, uh, you know, fiduciary responsibility to manage a business bank account should be looking into this so that it's just really a wonderful thing to have. Yeah. Um, and I discovered it by accident and, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I did. Um, just, just moving on from this topic of, you know, FDIC protection, uh, there's another form of risk that, you know, we face every day and seems relentless. And I wanted to get your thought on this as well, uh, David, which is, you know, fraud protection. It's one thing to say that I'm going to protect my deposits from, um, you know, from the rare event that a bank um, takes on risk that they shouldn't. Uh, but, you know, the other side of it is like, you know, we are relentlessly being attacked every day by kind of a network of people who want to like relieve us of our cash by pretending to be relatives, lottery ticket, you know, supplicants and so forth. Um, give us your sort of thought on, 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 on this and how you see it today, because there's some things that are unique to commercial accounts as it relates right. to fraud protection. Yeah. yeah um, it's a good point. And, and so you're right. We are shifting in risk categories from the risk associated with large balances held as a depositor within the banking system and how do you protect against that? So we've talked about FDIC insurance and then if your balance is above the $250,000 limit, consider an insured cash sweep. We're now shifting to, I've got my money in a bank account, any bank account, what's the risk of fraud or fraud loss as a business owner? Um, we are um, unfortunately seeing that, um, well, let me take a step back. The banking industry is one of the most um, protected industries from an info security and from a cybersecurity perspective. Not only do our regulators require it, but the public requires it. And so um, we have built, and many other banks, most banks have built fortresses around their core operating systems. Um, and again, it's a necessity. The, the criticality of the role that we play in the movement of money you know, across all banks and with our customers it just necessitates that we have that type of security posture from a, um, a, a cyber and a fraud risk perspective. But not all businesses are like us as a bank. And so many businesses have to make decisions constantly around where do I host my, you know, main infrastructure? Um, how am I providing, you know, a certain access to a networked group of employees? Where do I, um, you know, where do I house my critical data in my general ledger? Um, and as a result, the small to medium sized business community in many industries are um, a mix of a variety of levels of security protection when it comes from an infosec standpoint. The bad actors have figured this out. Um, while they're constantly knocking at our front door, um, we are constantly rebuffing them. And so we have seen the fraudsters and the bad actors begin to find where is the most vulnerable point in the money movement network or system. And sadly, many times the most vulnerable point is a small to medium sized business. Um, and they oftentimes will come through um, unpatched um, software applications that don't have the most um, current and up to date um, kind of patches applied to them or phishing which now is both via text and uh, via email, where the fraudsters will try to get an employee of the company to click on a compromised link and give them immediate access into the network. Um, the sophistication of these um, fraud attempts, also BC, are also increasing. Again, I, I hate to say it, but you know, just the the advent of modern technology and machine learning and AI, as wonderful as it will be in many parts of our economy and, and businesses, this is the other side of it where we are seeing fraudsters apply it to their advantage as well. And so fraud to, to small to medium-sized businesses that is again either coming through unpatched networks or um, you know, phishing or text phishing 
scams is a real risk. And so we are constantly talking to our business owners around cyber vigilance, infosec vigilance. And it, you know, it may to them seem like um, something that they um, would have 25th on a list of 20 things that they want to address because all business owners are tremendously occupied in running their business. Um, but the risk of not protecting your company from that is um, is becoming um, greater every day. And so it's not uncommon for, you know, a 10, 15, 50,000, hundred thousand um, dollar fraud or ransomware scenario to, to crop up in smaller sized businesses. And um, it makes sense to, to do everything you can to protect yourself against that. Subtext is the same, right? You can't ignore it. And That's at right. the same time, I don't think that you can do it uh, yourself. Like hard to imagine that, you know, everybody in the entire known universe is fully aware of all of the millions of evolving schemes uh, that <laughs> fraudsters perpetrate. And that's where like, you know, and I'll, you know, again, I'll be a shill for my own company, but people like us and people like f and right. uh, partner to create solutions that li limit the risk that bad things happen. You know, we'll spend more time on this, right? But it's an important point. Yeah, it I can't think that, be done in isolation, but it can't be ignored right. either. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's it. I mean, it, um, you know, increasingly for many companies and for many industries, it's not a question of if anymore, it's a question of when. And then it's your response when it does happen. And so um, being aware of what you can do to not only protect it from occurring, but also to be in a position where, to your point, you've partnered smartly to say, okay, if a fraud event does occur within my you know, bank account um, um, register, what protections do I have? And uh, there are protections out there. And, and uh, you know that will be, I know, a, a part of our conversation as we get into the demo with Andrew. Yeah. Exactly. So wear warm clothes. Don't cross the traffic. Uh, don't cross in traffic. Two things that you should do to protect yourself. Right. Uh, right. Let me switch gears. Like one of the unique things about like, you know, bank accounts, business bank accounts is that the, you know, balances are typically larger than consumer yep. accounts. Right. Right. And that uh, is, uh, you know, one reason why like we should be worried about things like protecting against loss. Yeah. But the flip side of it is that it, particularly in the interest rate environment that we're in today, David, it feels to me that more and more people are sort of asking you, people like you, the yeah. hard question of, hey, how do I increase my yield? Right. You know, what can I do to earn more interest on my bank account, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there are many answers to this question. And I want to just really kind of, you know, again, speaking as a CEO, worried about like, you know, how I can maximize my yield. The balance is something else, right? It doesn't mean that I can take the money that I have that I use for my operations and stick it in a, you know, six month CD, right? right? That doesn't work. Yeah, I can increase the yield, I can, but it sacrifices liquidity. To a great extent, I think what we have here is a almost a new opportunity, right? A new opportunity to ensure that businesses can strike the right balance between liquidity and yield, right? You know, yes. we talk all day long about like high yield products. Yeah, you can go to a, an ETF, you can go to a money market, you can go to a brokerage account. If you're like, you know, really risk averse or like want to play with fire, you can start trading in, you know, in, uh, you know, in the stock of the day, the meme stock of the day, right? But the fact is that, you know, if you're a responsible person, you're trying to balance liquidity and yield. That's and that's a really unique opportunity because you want instant liquidity and you want to maximize your yield. Your thought is, yeah, I think there's, uh, I, I do believe that it is balancing liquidity and yield. I also think that um, risk is another dynamic there. And you mentioned it just with regard to the various types of instruments that you could consider investing in both personally and or as a business um, that could generate a um, an interest return for you. Um, there is a direct correlation between, and it's it's you know intuitive, but there's a direct correlation between the more risk you take, the 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 higher likelihood for a higher return. Um, in the same way that liquidity or access to your money is also um, related. The longer that you're willing to be separated from your money, that's the concept of a CD. 
put your money into a CD for one year, you can't access it for one year and the banks will pay you a little higher interest rate. And so when you think about yield, which is another dimension that comes into play when you're managing cash, again, you just, you, you need to be mindful. I always tell people that, you know, when it comes to cash, there's no free lunch. You do have to consider the trade-off between liquidity or access to the funds and risk and yield. Um, you know, if the yield appears too good to be true, it usually is. There's probably either a liquidity or an access dynamic that um, may be a bit more restrictive than you would have at first considered, or there's a risk associated with um, placing your money there. And it may be appropriate, but you just would want to be eyes wide open with regard to the risk that you truly are taking. Because most operators of businesses do not want to speculate with their operating cash. Um, that cash has been hard earned. It has a purpose. It is the lifeblood of um, the business and the business's ability to continue on. And so you really need to think about yield in relationship to value or yield in context. So what's the right mix between liquidity and risk and yield? If you think about it in that way, you will tend to narrow the field to probably a tighter set of solutions that are more appropriate um, as a business operator. And we're in this unique place where I think that if you think about as we kind of build up towards what I would describe as a as a new kind of business bank account, balancing fraud risk, balancing bank failure risk, ba balancing high yield. These are all elements that right. ought to come together into yeah. one solution. And we'll spend more time on that. Um, and uh, I have a kind of a, you know, somewhat of a, uh, a stupid question, David. So please help me with this. As I As you were talking, I just realized that what is the connection between, you know, you use the term CD, one-year CD, and you'd pay me a little bit higher interest rate. Why do you pay me a higher interest rate if you're, you know, if you're able to hold on to my money for longer? What's the sort of dynamic there? What's the bank, your banker's answer to that question? Well, the banker's answer is, you know, we, we take in deposits from the community, and then we lend those deposits back out. So the greater certainty, BC, that we have in terms of how long we are going to have that deposit gives us a higher degree of confidence to lend that money back out into the community. Um, it is our funding source. So as a bank, we use those deposits to fund the loans that we make. And so we reward depositors with a higher interest rate if they're willing to keep that money or contractually through a CD, keep that money with us for a longer stated period of time, because then I know with certainty that this block of funds is available for me to lend out for 12 months. Um, and so it's that confidence that is of great value to us that the money is there. And as a result of the depositor giving us something of value, we give them something of value back, which is a higher interest rate. Um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to just really talk about here relating to that, thank you for that. And I, I have more questions, but I don't want to like turn this into an academic conversation about like, <laughs> you know, that, we yeah. could have a bank balance sheet webinar at some point if we <laughs> wanted to, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <clears throat> the, the question that I have is, uh, well, there's a persistent question that keeps coming up. Let's take a sidebar to answer okay. this, right? Okay. And to some extent, the answer is somewhat generic, but. I will turn this over to you. The question that seems to many people are, there are two themes. That let's let's attack those. And then I have one more point that I want to get yeah. to. One theme here is what causes a bank to fail? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> you, know, uh, it, you know, the reality is it isn't, um, it isn't always the same in every circumstance. But generally, if I'm answering that question, I would say that it's one of three things. The first, and this is a big part of what we saw last year with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and First Republic Bank, and that is a lack of access to liquidity. So when depositors or when liquidity within a bank begins to dry up, um, their ability to kind of run the cycle that is necessary. In what is that? Sorry to interrupt you. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that the liquidity within a bank has started to dry up? Depositors are taking their money and they're going to another bank. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for that. I can I can sometimes speak in in a bit more industry um, 
based terms. So when depositors are leaving a bank, it's often called a, a, a run on a bank, right? So you'll hear about bank runs. What a bank run is, is when multiple depositors are lining up in front of a bank and they're withdrawing their money. Because we don't, banks don't sit with a vault full of cash for every dollar that we have in deposit. We lent some of that money out. We place some of that money into a- And it's called a demand deposit account for a reason, right? That's because right. Because you demand yeah. your deposit back. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and so we have, we have regulatory requirements that we have to balance to make sure we have enough cash to meet those demands. Um, but when there's a run, it starts to really compromise the bank's ability to return those deposit dollars back quickly. That's often when the FDIC will step in and you know, look for another solution, oftentimes try to find an acquiring bank. So liquidity is the first reason. The second reason would then be credit. So if a bank has gotten into a position where um, they have lent money into an industry or into a certain geography that begins to become compromised and those borrowers cannot return the funds back to the bank, uh, that's not a good thing. We we operate on the principle that we lend money out, it returns back to us and we keep that cycle going. The third would then be capital. So all banks are required to hold a certain base of capital that protects against quite honestly, liquidity risk and interest rate risk and capital, or excuse me, um, credit risk. But if that capital base starts to shrink and shrink very quickly, again, because either losses are occurring or there are just are some other dynamics in play, a bank can no longer operate. You have to have a base required amount of capital and um, the regulators watch that closely. And if you cannot raise additional capital or supplement your capital through earnings, then you're potentially on a path to begin to fail. So liquidity, credit, and capital are, are three big contributors in most every bank failure. And in some ways, not to oversimplify this, like any business, it's a cash flow issue. Right on. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> so, right. Yeah. You know, uh, and so, and again, like, you know, put it into broader context. If you take risks that you shouldn't be taking, then you're going to be impacting your, your business and your cash flow. Which and was, so, you know, a part of our conversation last year around what were the risks that were inherent in the business models of Silicon Valley Bank or First Republic or Signature. And it was often concentration risk. Um, yeah. It was concentration risk that was in play. And uh, it led to a really difficult situation for uh, for those banks. A much nicer uh, topic to not nicer, but much, much deeper topic to kind of get into maybe at another webinar. Uh, but, you know, I think we're, you know, we won't have the time to dive into all of the reasons why banks, you know, what types of risks bank takes and that banks take and so forth. Another related kind of con con uh, uh, con question that keeps coming up again, it seems to me, is that it's twofold, right? Why doesn't, you know, the FDIC uh, raise or why doesn't, you know, whoever is responsible for setting the limit, why can't it be raised from, you know, $250,000 to something else? Yep. That's one one theme here. And why is it the same for all banks? You know, whether you're a small community bank or your big uh, money center bank, seems to me that the FDIC limit is the same. You know, again, these are these are maybe more theoretical questions and like questions that again go well past the scope of yeah. what we're trying to discuss today but any since they, they have come up i thought i would tee them up for you no they're really good questions and quite honestly they have been debated um vigorously within the industry over the past year since we had again three substantial bank failures um, all banks pay into the fdic insurance fund and so there's a cost associated with this balance between depositor confidence and protection that would be afforded through the FDIC insurance fund. And, and, um, and so that's really at the core of the debate, BC, is um, yes, um, our economy broadly has grown. Um, we went to $250,000 on FDIC insurance coverage back in 2008. It was temporary coming out of the Great Recession for two years. They codified it, made it permanent in 2010. But prior to that, we were at $100,000 of FDIC insurance coverage since 1980. So coming out of the 1970s, I think it was exactly 1980, we went from $60,000 to $100,000, stayed there for 30 years, and then went um, from $100,000 to $250,000. 
it's a balance and it, it will be debated um, um, both at a you know federal level and a local level. And um, there's a lot of constituents that um, believe that there's a solution here that the industry can provide that is just appropriate and natural. Um, and so, um, but it's not as easy as flip the switch or, you know, make the decision to go from 250 to 500. There really is, this is um, a, a collective mechanism uh, that the industry relies on. And so there's a lot of coordination across uh, the banking uh, industry to, to get that done. And does it require an act of Congress to raise that limit? Or can like, you know, the Federal Reserve simply say, now is the time to raise the limit, let's do it. Yeah. And so it does have the element of being political as well. And so that it could, with the best of intentions, be supported by the industry. And yet, you know, the the environment may just not be accommodating to have that uh, piece of legislation be supported and ultimately seen through. So um, there's a lot of factors that, that go into this. But rest assured, we and, you know, um, many within the industry are advocate, advocating for the right level of FDIC insurance to be in place. It's a very important mechanism, again, that within the U.S. banking system, we're fortunate to have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you you made the point about like what happened during the recession uh, of the 1930s and like the banks that, you know, failed before and after. And the, we don't have, you know, bank runs anymore I and mean, largely right. because, you know, of the existence yeah. of this insurance. Yeah. Um, one last thing I wanted to get to, and then I want to make sure that we have a chance to show you what we have partnered with you show the, the group that's on the call what we have partnered with you to create yeah. but one one last thing that i wanted to sort of tee up here is the when we did a survey last year uh, when silicon valley bank failed we found that people were interested in diversifying and indeed they went out and sort of took their monies and moved them to different uh, banks yeah but there's this this thing that i wanted to also ask you about which is that Sometimes it seems to me, and I've talked to a lot of businesses of late, which say like, I'd love to take advantage of this fantasy thing that you're describing, but I can't move my money out of my existing bank. I have covenants, I have restrictions, I have all kinds of things that prevent me from taking the money that is earning me three basis points into an account that has all of these protections. What's up with that? What, what's, the, what's the story with that? You know, it... Um... There is a reality that as a bank, that especially if it's um, if you've got a relationship with the business that you are also lending money to, that we prefer to have the depository and the operating accounts at the bank as well. That's just a reality. It's a reality in most all banking relationships. The 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 approach as a banker that you can take to that, if you've got a business owner that's asking some of these questions, like how, well. I appreciate that, but I've got large balances with you. How do I protect that? Or I do also have accounts that are at other banks. How do I bring those into view? Or do you have an appropriate yielding option? Or how are you helping me protect against fraud? You can either fight it and resist it as a banker, or you can begin to engage in that conversation with the, the business owner in the business and begin to find solutions to help solve it. And so I just don't believe in absolutes, BC, right? You and I talk about that. The, the reality is um, you can either fight it um, and create tension in that relationship or begin to find solutions and begin to find pathways forward that solve those pain points while still as a bank accomplishing what we would want, which is primacy in the relationship, you know, maintain an ability to still be of value and, um, you know, a primary point of, of service and, and value to that, to that business. That's the approach. Um, so it's not uncommon for that expectation to be there. The reaction or the response of bank A, B versus C may be very different. And um, I think as a business owner, it's, it's um, reasonable to have an expectation that you have a, a mature pointed conversation about these risks um, and the way you mitigate them uh, for your cash. You know, and it is a very, I mean, you know, sitting in your shoes, I know that it's a banking is a pretty competitive, you know, environment. Yeah. And it's always a good idea to ensure that you offer solutions that, you know, really are differentiated in the marketplace. Yeah. And what we're talking about here today is a bringing together a set of things that we think are necessary, certainly you know, born out of the ashes of Silicon Valley Bank, but in the year and month since then, 
we have worked with you and partnered with you to package up this set of things into a singular offering, which I want to sort of turn, I'll summarize, but then turn it over to Andrew so that he can walk us through it. And I'd invite anybody that's sort of on the call to give us a call, give you a call, give me a call, give us a call so that we can explain in more detail how all of these things sort of fit together. Again, Absolutely. four things, right, we're talking about. Recognizing that businesses have more than one FI relationship. And so there's a need to be able to multi-bank, right? And how do I ensure that I have the ability to do things like, you know, aggregating accounts, e simplifying account-to-account -account transfer, number one. Number two is to ensure that I strike that balance between liquidity and yield in a very unique way. And so we'll talk about that. Third is fraud protection. How do I ensure that somebody takes out an insurance policy to protect me and I don't have to do it myself? And the fourth is to diversify my, my deposits so that although the risk of bank failure is relatively low, as we've discussed, the risk is mitigated that I can sleep well at night knowing that my deposits are protected to something much greater than $250,000 and ideally in the entirety of my deposit with the bank. So those sounds four like things- great, I think, Sounds like a great combination to me. It's surprising <laughs> that we have worked, that you, this is this has this ever come up before or have we worked on it together? I think it's something yep. like that. So <laughs> yeah, that's excellent. So let, me let me turn it over to, to you, Andrew, and so you can walk us through this. Just again, to summarize, we have worked with FNBO. We at Sun Team have worked with FNBO to create such a product. And what we wanted to do is to walk you through the features and functions, and you know, Andrew will take us through it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, BC. So we should be looking at the application now. Um, right away, the multi-bank aspect um, should jump right out to you, I hope. I'm looking at this summary view of our banking module, which shows me all of my accounts, uh, not just checking plus, which is provided by FNBO, offered in partnership with them, but any checking savings accounts, even credit and loan accounts that I've chosen to connect here uh, within the SendTime application. I have access to my daily balance information, um, and full statements as well, actually. If I drill down into one of my accounts, I'll see that I can see every transaction in and out in the statement view, searchable, can filter um, by date range as well. I can also view how my balances are evolving over time. Um, and I can zero in specifically on any transfer activity carried out uh, within the SendTime platform itself. A lot of our customers get um, significant benefit just from being able to bring all these statements, all these transactions into one application instead of having to jump back and forth between the different institutions that they likely bank with. And if I do want to connect another account uh, that I open up, I can do that with just um, a couple minutes time, um, putting in my online banking credentials. Um, signing in and allowing send time to pull my transactions and balances in uh, to give me visibility here as well. And that experience is a little bit like what people might have experienced with a product like Mint. It's a very similar idea. Absolutely. We have yeah, a question coming in, Andrew, if you don't mind. Okay. How many banks are connected to the system or can be? There's, yeah, so in terms of just visibility into balances here, there's there's no limit. Um, you just have to go through that that setup um, and connection. Um, and yeah, any any accounts that you hold, you can make them uh, visible here. Thanks for highlighting that. Of now, of course, I do wanna take um, some time to talk about uh, sometimes checking plus. Um, so this is that account provided by FNBO that BC and Dave were alluding to. It's a high yield checking account with greatly expanded FDIC coverage through an insured cash suite. And it's basically our answer to that, that trilemma, that interplay between liquidity, um, risk, and yield uh, that Dave introduced. Is that so, a word? Trilemma? You make that up? No, um, I'm I'm misusing it actually a little bit because it's supposed okay. to refer to a case where you can only have two of three things. Um, you know, what we're offering is um, two plus a little bit of a third. Um, so the, you know, ex ex uh, expanded FDIC in coverage um, is a way to address risk, a way to limit risk. 
Uh, the account is fully liquid. Liquid. You can use it like a checking account, move money in and out. And um, I guess the impossibility of the trilemma, um, it does offer meaningful yield. Um, so two and a quarter percent APY, um, it's more than you would get from a traditional checking account as, as well. So the ability to get something back on your deposits as well as protect them. And as I said, ultimately, this will function like a checking account. Um, if I go a level deeper, it could be thought of as having two components, the operating component and the sweep component. And simply any uh, funds in excess of that $250,000 limit uh, will be automatically swept um, into the sweep account portion of the account. And that will then be diversified across different banks to ensure that every dollar um, falls under the F FDIC coverage. And conversely, as you move money out of the operating account again, uh, money will be swept back out of the sweep accounts into your operating account, um, ensuring that you still have access to it. Um, so for this you know, mocked up example, behind the scenes, I would actually have you know, four different accounts where the money is held and fully, fully protected. Uh, but this is all automated, um, giving you the benefit of the protection without having to do any of this money movement yourself. You can also handle um, transfers, transactions right within um, the banking view here. Um, so if I click on the transfer icon, I can move money um, between any of the accounts that I've um, connected. It doesn't actually have to be limited uh, to the checking plus account. I can also move funds between um, across banks, um, across you know completely different accounts outside of checking plus, uh, no limits there, no limits on the number of transactions um, that I issue here either. Um, each one of the transactions is gonna fall under our fraud protection program as well. Um, so we cover unauthorized uh, electronic funds transfers up to uh, the tune of $100,000 uh, per incident. So in the unlikely occurrence that your account is compromised and a fraudulent transfer is initiated, that would that would be covered to $100,000. And this is you know, an extra protection, extra layer of security on top of additional controls we have in place, such as two-factor authentication and automated uh, transaction monitoring, where we look at every transaction that passes through our system and try and highlight anything out of the ordinary, flag anything that might be potentially fraudulent based on you know, past tr transaction history. So when you put together the you know, visibility into all your accounts, the ease of transferring money between them, you have a high degree of flexibility in how you potentially make use of the Checking Plus account as well. Obviously, we're thrilled when someone comes to us and wants to make this um, their primary account, but it can coexist um, with other accounts, other banking relationships, uh, either as a safe repository for funds with that expanded uh, insurance limit um, or potentially as a higher yield option um, or a placement for a uh, low to no yield checking account, say, um, as you know, a merchant account, a funding account for AP transactions, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how one would use this, how one would take advantage of it. And the last thing I want to just highlight quickly as we're running out of time, um, you know, I mentioned credit and loan accounts also visible here. Um, one account uh, provided by FNBO as well is the Centime Credit Line. Uh, this gives customers the ability to, um, again, right within this interface, draw on a line of credit to cover any shortfalls in working capital. Um, so the folks that you know apply and are approved for this line of credit can, whenever they need to, pull money into one of their connected accounts um, to help plug any, any gaps in their cash flow until new collections come in. And to specify the desired amount up to my available limit, uh, specify the payback period, and then I can pull those funds into my account and they'll just need to be paid back um, over the payback period with a small fee. So put this all together and you have, in short, you know, what we believe business banking should look like. Simple, bank agnostic, easy to use platform that serves up new products like uh, Checking Plus that allow customers to manage, protect, and optimize their cash and working capital. And I'll pick it back to Devin and BC. Um, time for a final question. Yeah, I I want to make sure that it's very clear that you know Centim Checking Plus and 
Andrew mentioned it and we got lost somewhere in the in the discussion of language is that you know it is a two and a quarter percent yield that is offered on the account today uh, and that is uh, two and a quarter percent on a checking account which to the best of my knowledge is a somewhat of a unique offering uh, and uh, you know it balances that high yield and high liquidity as well. Yes, BC, thank you so much for bringing that um, up to attention as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to leave this without letting everyone know. Um, first off, BC, David, Andrew, thank you very much for your time today. I think this was a really interesting discussion. And Andrew, a really fast, um, we know we only gave you a short amount of time after our talk, but a really thorough demo of the banking solutions that SendTime offers. In addition to our banking solution, we also do APAR automation. So you have an entire all-in-one solution for your cash management strategy. Um, if you're curious to learn a little bit more, I did share in the chat links to our tour page where you can um, create your own free trial account and also our demo page. So if you're interested in having a more personalized conversation about what we can offer your business in terms of banking or AP or AR, um, we encourage you to check out sendtime.com slash demo. Um, I know we are at the top of the hour, so I just want to say thank you again for all of our speakers and for everyone attending, for giving us your attention for over the last hour or so, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Devin. Thank you, David and Andrew, yeah. for uh, being part of the conversation. Thanks, BC. Good seeing thank you, as you, always. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.